And now, an eighth special presentation. In this edition of Artbeat Nation, a sculptor delves into her self-portrait. What it takes to be an artist, you have to be, especially a woman artist, incredibly determined and incredibly receptive. A trumpeter creating an evolution. It's not about being glitz and glamour and famous and notoriety and red carpet and all that stuff. A top chef trades her knife for a pen. I tapped into that sort of uh, creativity that I once knew that I had. And a model takes a different view on beauty. It's really important for people to just be who they want to be and to be able to express themselves freely and do what they want. It's all ahead on Art Beat Nation. Funding for Art Beat Nation was made possible by contributions to eight from viewers like you. Thank you. Judith Shea, a New York-based artist, explores the human form through various materials, including cloth and steel. In a recent exhibit, she showcased her creations deriving from the self-portraits of women artists throughout the ages. had a kind of a sheltered childhood in terms of cultural things but I always was making things I was always drawing um, and I had a, a fantasy of my career so I had the idea that I was going to live in a, a skylit filled space wherever I got that idea from a movie probably uh, and I would be dancing and some kind of drawing whatever I never painted though so um, it was kind of making things. And I was studying ballet. So my first great artwork that I loved was Degas' Little Dancer, 14 years old. I am from an Irish-American Catholic family, and I had a religious upbringing. I went to Catholic schools um, all my life uh, until art school. So that was a wonderful shock. And then I pretty much uh, just parted with it as far as, uh, certainly as far as imagery. But it's at, in retrospect, again, I realized that was the first place I saw art was in the church. And especially statuary, which in the end is my thing. Her own style really uh, was formulated out of the kind of research into the show. I felt that the development in the portraiture over time, from 1858, you know, was parallel with the whole history of American women in society. I have to think that these women, they would have had an awareness that this representation of themselves was going to be a historical document, and because the Academy's collection is an archive will not be, it will be, not be parted. Gertrude Fisk, who was a uh, successful uh, painter and portraitist, she in a way represents the end of an era in terms of designated by her costume, essentially. She's in a room that you can judge by looking into the painting is a dedicated studio. There's no domestic accessories in there. Um, and so, first of all, that tells of her professionalism. She's got her professional tools slightly in the frame of the picture, the edge of her palette in the left corner and the edge of the canvas in the right corner. It's a rather dark painting. There's light in a, in a window far away, but she has a white ruffled collar, which I have to see is slightly an allusion to d the Dutch masters. And so she's kind of, in a way, imp implying herself, inserting herself in the history of art. Felice Mixter 
on the other hand, is a younger, slightly younger woman, it, it appears, in, in her self-portrait. She represents the change that happened, which was uh, what we call the flapper style now. She's wearing the chemise, which has a rather low neckline, um, the single strand chain, the hair is, is pulled back, but then the, what they called in those days fringe, which we now call bangs, uh, cut. That, that was also particular to that era of style. Ellen Emmett Rand, very successful, particularly as a portraitist. Uh, we found in the research in the year 1930, so that's, you know, six months after the crash, she made $75,000 and supported her family because her husband was in banking or finance in some way. She did uh, three portraits of FDR, one of which is his official White House portrait. Doesn't get better than that in terms of, you know, being a successful artist. So she shows us in her painting smock, holding her palette, almost like a shield, like armor, wearing a you know, a studio hat, basically, uh, where she's, she's putting aside her feminine traits. She's wearing very masculine kind of Corbusier glasses, but she's also absolutely making dead-on eye contact with the viewer. She's saying, you know, she's proud of, of her place as a professional, and that's how she wants to be taken for history. Um, there are two sort of veiled self-portraits of me in the show. Um, one which I made in 1991, which um, is called Artist. It's cast steel, um, because, uh, partly because it was, it was all this back and forth um, with history and the idea that all the uh, big sculptures being made by the male artists of my time period were often steel and um, cast steel is another thing, but anyway. I tried to make it as spare as possible. So essentially, uh, it's a barefooted woman. So partly the idea of bare feet is the, um, w how the gods are rendered in classical statuary. So it's the idea of a, of a kind of timelessness. Uh, she's wearing a dress so that her female identity is not hidden. Also, that dress is, was the sort of central figure of years of my work, that kind of hollow sheath dress. And then the hands, one is in a clenched pose and the other is open. And to me, that was the essential idea of, of what it takes to be an artist. You have to be, especially a woman artist, incredibly determined and incredibly receptive. This piece behind me here, still standing, is 20 years later. It started initially as the idea of, after all that dark work about 9-11, I felt that I needed a piece that was the opposite, you know, that was uh, like a resurrection, like a, you know, survivor. And so what came into my mind initially was an all-white statue, all, you know, all light following that idea, um, in this case, the figure has both hands clenched because it's just that much harder as you get older, but also particularly when I started this having to do with 9-11, the, the determination to go past it you know, was uh, very great on the part of many. I feel very honored to be part of the Academy, to have been asked to do this show, and also to be a kind of heir of these, all these fabulous women who, I hope one of the things that comes out of this show is that their careers will also be looked at again. To see more of Judith Shea's work, visit her website, judithshea.com. Las Vegas trumpeter, composer, and conductor David Perico has played for marquee shows like Cirque du Soleil's Viva Elvis and countless others. Today, he and his band Pop Evolution are making their own headlines by putting a cool, classic twist on well-known hits.
My name is David Perico. How's everybody doing out there? Welcome to Trumpet the player, composer, and conductor. Some of the um, most memorable people that I've worked with, uh, Barry Manilow, Natalie Cole, um, Chuck Mangione, uh, Gladys Knight as well, worked with Gladys a lot, and Donnie Marie. Life as a working musician in Vegas is quite hectic. You've got to be on no matter what. Your chops have to always be in shape. Um, you have to be able to play lead, sight read, be able to jump into any musical situation. It could be Frankie Avalon one day, the next day it could be Prince. So you never see the music beforehand, you see it the day of the show. You rehearse a couple hours before and then showtime. What made me want to have my own band was um, I, re I was really inspired by Chuck Mangione and Maynard Ferguson and Dizzy and how they had their own bands and I thought that was just super, that was just super cool. So here's some Lady Antebellum for you. I came up with the name Pop Evolution uh, because uh, I'm playing pop music of the day or a couple years past and it's just a different spin to hear that, you know, 14 horns uh, it, assembled to playing Motley Crue. So maybe it's a different way of uh, evolving pop music. There are 19 members in the band, plus me and the singer. Some of the people in the band, if not all the people in the band, basically play in major strip shows here in Las Vegas. Really super talented people. They're all artists in their own right. The gal that was singing with uh, Pop Evolution was Savannah Smith, and she's actually the lead uh, singer with Vegas The Show at Planet Hollywood. Our regular singer, Naomi Morrow, um, fantastic. She's a singer-songwriter herself. There is a long tradition of trumpet players and female singers in, in Vegas, like Louis Prima, Kelly Smith, Harry James, uh, Helen Forrest. I like it, I like that play where the trumpet is a voice and the female singer is the, is the voice. The hardest thing about putting a band together like this is the organization and then the writing. I mean, I'm writing every single part. Typical day for me to sit at the piano, I might just warm up on some jazz chords, voicings. The process I go through writing original music, um, usually there's just a, an idea that comes in your head, and I, I do all of my writing at the piano. You know, um, the instrumentation, do I want the violin to do this? Do I want the French horn? Is this out of the range of the French horn? And sometimes, you know, the piano for me is the therapist's couch in a way. You can work a lot of things out. And sometimes some good things come out of it. Sometimes, you know, it's just the same old stuff. But every time, once in a while, you get lucky and a song comes out of it. So, so right now we're looking at um, the night, uh, a Nightingale song, which is an original piece. What I had in mind was, is love the band, you know, of course, Led Zeppelin and that, that vibe of cashmere. So this was my spin on having that, that cashmere um, kind of vibe, but with maybe something a little bit more dramatic or a melody that, that sticks. This is a song that features the viola, French horn, and flugelhorn with some offset with some really rocking Jimi Hendrix style or Jimmy Page style guitar playing. You know, composing is one aspect and arranging is one aspect, but the majority of my, of my profession and living is trumpet. I love the trumpet. So like that note on the trumpet is a really sharp note, so I gotta be careful not to give that to the trumpet sometimes, or I'll give it to the string player. And then if I'm gonna play something more, if it's gonna be where you can take it, like maybe what Maynard Ferguson would do, is take things up like two octaves or something,
like that. What an audience gets from a Pop Evolution show is, first of all, having a great time and seeing something that they've never seen before, they've never, they've never experienced in that size of band and taking home like, there's always someone who appeals to somebody in the band, whether it was the guitarist or I like the French horn or the viola or the, what was that, a bassoon? They're seeing something different <clears throat> and a new twist on, a, on an old dish maybe. What I'd like people to know about live music in, in Las Vegas is it's not about being glitz and glamour and famous and notoriety and red carpet and all that stuff. Uh, I think what people should know is there, there is still a core group of musicians and artists in town that are very dedicated to their craft, that have trillions of hours of practicing on it to maintain what they do. Um, and when you come see something like any of the other lounge bands in town or our band, hopefully that comes across. It's not about being on a billboard, it's not about fame, famous, anything like that. Many, many thanks to each and every one of you for coming out and supporting live music in the band. I'm very, I'm very lucky. Uh, I'm very grateful for the support in the community, the musicians that are, that are behind me, that we're all together, uh, the fellow musicians in town that come out and support us uh, as we do them. There's a camaraderie. I feel extremely lucky to have this opportunity to, um, to have the band play some of my original music and, um, you know, develop together. Pop Evolution. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you real soon. To find out more, visit davidcarico.com. Next, Christine Ha amazed viewers when she won season three of the popular series Master Chef. Besides being a great cook, she's also blind. However, her talent reaches beyond the kitchen. What many people don't know is that Ha is also passionate about poetry. Blind chef Christine Ha's success on MasterChef showed off her culinary skills. The winner of MasterChef, Christine. But Christine's creative talents aren't limited to the kitchen. She's also a gifted writer. As a child, I loved to read, I did love to write, but it wasn't something I really took seriously because I think my parents didn't think it would be able to, it's a, something that could you know, financially support myself with. So I didn't take it too seriously, but it was more of something that I really loved to do. This is how you bow to elders. This is what you do when you get red envelope money. This is the percentage you must save this is what you can buy with the rest. Don't speak unless you're spoken to. Don't prance around. Don't sit with your legs like that. Don't yell, don't run, don't slouch. That's what boys do, and God didn't make you a boy. I had a lot of health issues where I was diagnosed with an autoimmune condition um, that's called neuromyelitis optica, or NMO, and it's uh, an autoimmune condition where um, it affects my central nervous system and so it affected my vision, my spinal cord, and I had to leave work and uh, I had to go through a lot of rigorous physical and occupational therapy and I think during those times when you're at your very lowest in life you do a lot of soul searching and I actually returned to reading and writing as a, a, a sort of catharsis I think and uh, I believe I tapped into that sort of uh, creativity that I once knew that I had and I think it uh, felt much more fulfilling and so I decided to go ahead and pursue creative writing. Cover the rice with enough water but not too much. Always set out fruit after every meal. Brew a pot of jasmine tea even if your guests say no thank you. Let the foe simmer overnight but don't overcook it. But what if I don't like eating that stuff? you have to know how to cook traditional comfort food. Right now, sitting in the studio, I don't really see anything. It feels like I'm in a cloud. I can tell there's a light source coming from over here, but um, I cannot tell that there's anybody else in the room. 
the best way for me to describe it uh, would be if you were to come out of a really hot shower and you looked immediately into that steamy mirror, that's pretty much all I see. This is the charred meat you eat, the broken chair you use, the last place you take. This is what you can do instead of saying I love you. Because I have gone through this, I've become a much more compassionate person and I think from that compassion stems the creativity. Name your son after his grandfather. But what if I bear a daughter? Keep trying if your eggs produce a girl. But be sure to teach that girl everything she needs to know to be a better woman than you can ever be. To find out more, visit theblindcook.com. Models are often regarded as being the gold standard of beauty. Within a subset of the industry, models such as L'Oreal Andrea are making their mark by breaking the mold. Rob Stewart talks to Andrea about her views on beauty and what she calls alternative modeling. When you think about modeling, what do you think about? Well, when it comes to international cover girl L'Oreal Andrea, she hopes you think of her. L'Oreal, good to see you. Hi, great to see you. Thanks for meeting us here in your photo shoot. Yes, of course. And congratulations on your recent international uh, covers. Yes, thank you so much. Including Gothic Beauty. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Well, it was a great opportunity and um, my photographer had been talking to some people and they decided they wanted to use our picture for the front cover. And so it's just been a wonderful experience. I've been able to meet so many people. So what does alternative modeling mean? Because that's what you call it. Yeah. Alternative, I would say, it's just more of like an edgy type of modeling because, you know, most models are not all like 5'8 or 6 foot, you know, and I'm shorter and there's a lot of shorter models that are have more crazy hair and tattoos and piercings and that sort of thing, just kind of be more like original. And so there's a lot of jobs still out there and a lot more opportunities for a lot more like clothing companies and that kind of thing. What is your message when it comes to sharing the message of alternative modeling and to sharing the message of L'Oreal Andrea? Well, basically, I just think that it's really important for people to just be who they want to be and to be able to express themselves freely and do what they want. And maybe that is taking a little bit of a risk in life. I didn't always just grow up thinking, you know, I'm going to be a model or I want to be a designer. I kind of branched out and just kind of, you know, took, you know, hold of it and just kind of took it from there. And it's been a great opportunity ever since. And I just think people should be able to branch out and do what they want in life. Do you think part of your message is about breaking stereotypes? Yes, I think so. I think a lot of us, you know, we just, we're so judgmental or, you know, so used to just one simple way of doing things that it's good to just kind of branch out and do different things and not be so afraid of, you know, being who we are maybe on the inside or, you know, trying to cover up being maybe who we really are. Cool. Yeah. What did you think the first time you saw your face on a national magazine cover? I was so excited. It was just the most amazing feeling to be able to be like, oh, all this work that I put into this, I'm finally made it. What are you thinking about when you're modeling and where are you coming up with those poses? I know, I'm just kind of just, you know, relaxing and just kind of thinking about, you know, like movements kind of more and I, I, I study a lot of fashion magazines. I really like high fashion poses and that sort of thing. What would you say to someone who may be watching who has a dream to want to step out and do something like you've done? You know, I would say you just need to go out there and just do it. Just go out there and do it. And also, you have to have a lot of confidence. Those are the key things that, you know, you've you got to go forth with that and have those things to work hard at, you know, and you'll get there. Inspirational <laughs> yes. words. Well, L'Oreal yes. Andrea, good to see you Thank in you Sacramento so today here on your wonderful. photo shoot with your photographer, you. Jesse. Uh, he's Thanks. got his camera ready. So yeah, I'll he's ready. <laughs> Take care. For more arts and culture, visit azpbs.org slash artbeat, where you'll find featured videos and information on the Arizona art scene. Funding for Artbeat Nation was made possible by contributions to aid from viewers like you. Thank you.